Let us pray once again. Our Father in heaven, we pray that, Lord, you would grant us understanding. You have told us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Indeed, we have read here of those who feared the Lord. We thank you for the wisdom that you gave them. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that as you speak, your servant would hear. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I begin this evening, uh, the sun is lowering in the sky, and it shines right into my window. Uh, it may be that uh, it won't wind up staring me right in the eyes, but at some point, I just might have to get up and close my shades, so just uh, be forewarned. This morning, we took, I took a, a portion of a verse and that formed the title of the message this morning. Uh, these things are written for your instruction. And it, of course, is speaking of the Old Testament and how those things which were written of old were written for our instruction. And the passage in 1 Corinthians 10 went even further to say, these things happened and then were written down for our instruction. And so we are again reminded that God is the God of the sovereign God of history, and he actually has brought these events to pass for our instruction. So there is something more going on here than just attaining a few facts. This is, a, when we're talking about instruction here, this is a matter of being transformed by the renewing of our minds. The instruction that the Lord does within us is changing us, is transforming us, is working life and light and wisdom into us. It is making us over into the image of Christ. That is the instruction that is taking place. And so we see how his salvation is uh, very much connected to his instruction. So, uh, and, and we see, I'm just going to share a number of verses, some we already uh, looked at, um, together with a few more that again show how it is that led by the Lord Jesus himself, the New Testament authors, the apostles who were sent by the Lord Jesus, used the scriptures of the Old Testament. Again, Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. The Lord Jesus himself says in John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. And then he draws this out even further in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27, and he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then finally, 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. All these things, the prophets of the Old Testament who spoke and who wrote, looked into their own prophecies 
seeking to understand what they had to say about the coming Christ and his subsequent glories following his sufferings. And so <clears throat> it is not an imposition of some New Testament idea to go back and somehow artificially impose Christ and the message of salvation. But what we see and what we are to look for as we read the Old Testament is the story of Jesus, the story of Christ, anticipated again and again, and the salvation that he would accomplish, anticipated again and again. For the Lord looked forward to the giving of his only begotten Son. So what we are going to do is look at this passage in Judges 13, and I suspect that uh, many of you, <clears throat> if you hadn't seen before, you certainly have already seen some similarities between the, this passage that we have, uh, have read and uh, a number of others, of course, uh, coming to a climax in the account of the birth of our Lord. But what we need to see here is the elements of Christ and the gospel in this account, in Judges 13. And first, we will see the need of God's people for a Savior. The second thing, we will see the person of Christ himself foreshadowed. And then finally, we will see the saving work of Christ foreshadowed. So, the need of salvation, the person of Christ, and the work of Christ. We find them all foreshadowed in this account. First, the need of God's people for a Savior. Everyone who has studied the book of Judges has <clears throat> come to that verse or those verses in Judges chapter 2 that give kind of an overview of the entire time of the judges. They describe what it was all like. And the, I believe the analogy of a roller coaster has been used. Um, we read in Judges 2, 18 and 19, whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. And then in Judges 3, 9, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And so um, you have this, the people drifting away um, as soon as Joshua and all of those who had served with him passed away. The people drifted away from God. And all of those nations that they had not successfully and obediently driven out they had fallen short of what God had not only commanded them to do, but had enabled them to do, and they just didn't do it. And so there they have all of these people around them serving other gods. They would still have been fine if they had said, all right, well, we're not going to serve their gods. We're going to cling to our own God. Those gods are no gods, but they didn't. They began to see how let's 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 see the first step how these nations serve their gods and then we'll serve our god the way they serve their gods and then after that step they eventually came to simply serving the gods of the nations the baals the ashtoreths and all of the practices that that uh, that that implied and so of course the lord says look if, 
It's, it's perfectly logical, it's perfectly reasonable, it's perfectly fair that if you are going to worship the gods of those people, then you should submit to those people and their gods, and so I'll simply give you over to them. You don't seem to cherish your uh, specialness, your uniqueness as my people. You want to be simply amalgamated with the nations around you. Fine, I'll give you over to them. There's absolutely nothing unfair about that at all. It's exactly what they were asking for. And then, of course, they um, grow a brain and realize how miserable they are. They finally realize that it's because they've forsaken the Lord, so they cry out to the Lord. And after that pattern that we see in Psalm 107, they but cry out. They, and the Lord doesn't even wait for them to go through a period of probation where he can see whether they're really serious and whether they are bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. But in his mercy and grace, he answers them. He sends them a judge, and that judge delivers them. Now, one of the first things we note there, uh, as we compare Judges 2, 18 and 19, and then Judges 3, 9, those two passages where uh, sort of speaks in general terms about things that were happening all through this age uh, of the judges. Um, <clears throat> note the different word that is used in Judges 3, 9. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a, and it doesn't say judge, it says raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel. And then instead of saying who judged them, as it says elsewhere, it says, who saved them. So these judges are inter interchangeably called deliverers or saviors. Now, it's a different word, but it's applied to the same person. And in the same way, uh, these judges judged and these deliverers delivered or these saviors saved. And it was just as much a part of their office to judge as they administered justice to the people, as they brought judgment, that is condemnation, upon their enemies, and as they also delivered and saved the people. So we can see already there a glimmer of the office of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were judges in the sense of rulers. They, in a way, fulfilled the office of a king, and they were saviors and deliverers, and so they fulfilled the office of a priest and uh, even a prophet because, of course, they represented uh, the Word of God to the people. So we see that these judges were mediators for God just as Christ would be a mediator. But the need, of course, was for the sin of the people. They kept turning away from God. He kept having to bring them back through these judges. So uh, this was the situation in the book of Judges, and we open with those words. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Then we come to God's provision. What is God going to do this time as they are going to cry out to him? Well, <clears throat> it is going to be a while before they cry out to him. Uh, but we see here that the Lord is already preparing the next judge. Even before they have gotten miserable enough to cry out to him, uh, within about nine months, they're going to be um, ready to start. But it's still going to be a few years before Samuel, or rather Samson, is going to be of the age where he begins his ministry as their judge and throws off the Philistines. <clears throat> what we do want to see here is the encounter that first Manoah's wife 
And then Manoah, together with his wife, has with the angel of the Lord. He is called interchangeably the, the angel of God and the angel of the Lord. <clears throat> One of the first features here is the choice of the people. Manoah and his wife, who is never named in this passage, are quite obviously parents who have nothing noteworthy about them. They're not mentioned before or after. <clears throat> they, uh, something is said about the ancestry of them. They're located in terms of their genealogy, but uh, really there's nothing remarkable about them. But they are chosen by God. Again, what a similarity there is to Elkanah and Hannah. What a similarity to even when you go back to the beginning, when he was first chosen, to Abram and Sarai. What a similarity to, um, to, to, to Rachel and Isaac, or uh, Rachel and, and uh, Jacob, rather. And we think of Jacob and Rachel and how they gave birth to Joseph. And all of these barren women, and nothing really special about them, this was the case with Hannah, and of course, finally, we think of Elizabeth and then Mary. In every case, nothing really outstanding or special, nothing that God would say, all right, I'm going to choose this person because they have such great potential, or they have such a great reputation, and everybody will listen to them. Everybody will see they're well, this person coming from them is well born. No, he he chooses people who are of no particular repute. It's not that they're bad people. They're just kind of, we would say today, nobodies. This is who, who he chooses. Then the second thing we notice in the text is, of course, the most obvious thing. The wife has never born a child. Like Sarah, like Rachel, with Joseph, like Hannah with Samuel, like Elizabeth with John the Baptist, like Mary, the mother of Jesus. All of these, the Lord makes it very clear that he is going to perform a miracle, that the miraculous, that his direct intervention is involved in the birth of one who is to be a savior, a deliverer. Samson, all of his flaws, is going to be a judge and a deliverer. He is going to be a savior. And so the Lord features this part of the story. Samson will be born of a woman who was, up to the time he was born, barren. And he would especially enable her to conceive. It is also significant that the angel of the Lord appears to the woman and tells her that she will conceive and bear a son, and that he would save Israel from the Philistines. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her that she will conceive and bear a son, and that he would save his people from their sins. Each of them speaks directly to the woman. And even when she goes and tells her husband, Manoah, about the angel of the Lord coming and telling her these things, things which, by the way, she quite accurately relays to him. She doesn't alter it in any way. She tells him exactly what the angel said. And Manoah then says, well, he, he prays, oh God, send this man again so that I can be in on this and I can know because, you know, I'm, I'm the head of the home and, and I, I want to help. But the, when the angel comes, and it, it's not that I don't think that Manoah is trying to get in the way here or trying to assert himself in any inappropriate way, 
But it is interesting that the angel of the Lord here once again speaks of the woman and of what her responsibility is to be, that she should not drink any wine. She has got to be uh, very careful because her child is going to be a Nazarite. It's going to be set apart for the Lord's purpose and for the Lord's service. And again, the important thing is that the woman who is to bear this child is, <clears throat> she is to be God's instrument for bringing this Savior, this Deliverer, into the world, to God's people. Manoah has nothing to do with it, just as Joseph had nothing to do with it. Now, the Lord spoke to Joseph in a dream and explained to him what was going on, but it was basically Joseph just, you know, hang tight and, and, uh, and see the salvation that the Lord is going to accomplish. And it was going to be, Mary was his instrument in this. So it seems that in so many ways, again, the unremarkable nature of those whom he chose, the fact that he worked directly and spoke directly to the woman who was to be the uh, mother of this Savior, shows this is a work of God. And it was a woman who uh, was, to, it was not through just the normal, ordinary course of events. Of course, in the case of all the others, the husband was involved in that it was his natural son. But they, she could not have conceived other than with the help of God. In the case of Mary, the husband was completely out of the picture. Um, what was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. Very important in every one of these cases to, to uh, as a part of the account, a part of the history of salvation, that it is done by God, that it is, uh, it, it is begun by him, and that the, <clears throat> the human, there is human involvement very clearly, but he is the one who is um, who begins it and who brings it to pass. Then uh, we see in verse eighteen the when Manoah does ask, "What is your name?" Um, the angel answered Manoah when he asked his name that it was wonderful. Now. There are even some translations that instead of translating it wonderful, they will say, why do you ask my name? Because it is beyond understanding. As if the angel was answering, well, why do you ask my name? Why do you bother? You're not smart enough to understand. If I were to tell you my name, it would be way over your head. And so I'm not even going to bother to tell you my name. It's beyond your understanding. I do not believe that's what it means. Because we see this word, the very same word, used elsewhere, and it is clearly a name. I believe what the angel of the Lord did was to tell Manoah his name. He answered the question. We go to Isaiah 9-6, and we uh, read there in that very famous passage of the coming of the Messiah, and his name, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I think the way that it is written in the King James and the way that it is sung in the Messiah is correct, that Wonderful is not an adjective that is modifying Counselor. It is a separate noun. It is a separate name. His name shall be called Wonderful. So here, very clearly, this is a name by which the one who also would be called the Mighty God and the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would be called Wonderful. It's significant because the very word 
wonderful means something so much more than it means um, in, in common parlance. Um, I've gotten into the habit at the end of my uh, devotions through the week of saying, have a wonderful day. And uh, I've, I've got to think that through a little bit. I think I am perhaps hoping that as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, we might experience a wonderful day. Not that, not meaning that just everything will go well for you. That's usually what we mean. When something is wonderful, we, we think it is just everything splendid. It is just everything's gone together well. All the circumstances have fallen in the right place and uh, just had a good day. It's been a wonderful day. Um, there is something more to the biblical word that is translated wonderful. It is a word which at its root actually means to be separate. And so it's speaking of something that is separation from this world. It is something other. And so very often, this is the reason why wonderful things cannot be understood. Because it's not that they're irrational, it's that they, are, they belong to a realm that is beyond our grasp, beyond our understanding. The things having to do with God, heavenly things. And so when the angel of the Lord says, my name is wonderful, then he is claiming that he is not of this creation. He is from heaven. We have observed again and again, of course, I haven't mentioned this, but um, it's well to remember every time we have the definite article with the angel, the angel of the Lord or the angel of God, we uh, it is clear, some, there is some clue in the context that this is God. This is deity. And yet, it is a deity that is distinguishable in person from uh, often, uh, we, we say, it'll speak of the Lord, and then it'll speak of the angel of the Lord. And there seems to be a distinction between the two. Indeed, of course, that is consistent with the biblical picture more fully uh, revealed in the New Testament that this would be the distinction between the Father and the Son. So this is the angel of the Lord manifesting himself, the Son of God manifesting himself and actually speaking to men before he becomes uh, a man, becomes a child, and becomes one of us. So there clearly the person of Christ is foreshadowed. He is the one who is wonderful. He is, <clears throat> um, uh, he is the angel of the Lord. And he approaches uh, the one who is to be the bearer of the Savior uh, <clears throat> in, in the same way that uh, uh, time and time again, um, this uh, someone is set aside to be the instrument of bringing the Savior into the world. Now, the last thing I want to look at, uh, all right, if the person of Christ is foreshadowed, let's lastly look at the saving work of Christ foreshadowed, and that is here as well. Lest there be any doubt as to his identity as God, the angel of the Lord, who has instructed Manoah to offer his sacrifice to the Lord, then goes up in the flame which consumes the sacrifice. He signifies there not only that he is the one who is accepting the sacrifice, and only God could accept this sacrifice. But he's doing something even more than that. He is identifying with the sacrifice which is offered up to the Lord. Instead of saying, instead of just 
extending hospitality to me in Manoa and you know, killing a goat so that we could all eat it together. I'm not going to eat with you, but if you offer a burnt offering to the Lord, and the burnt offering was very clearly identified as an offering for sin. It was an offering which uh, was a substitute for the sinner who brought it as an offering. And this perfect sacrifice was to be sacrificed and to take the punishment in the stead of the sinner who deserved death for his sin. That was the meaning of a burnt offering. And so the angel of the Lord commanded Manoah to make this burnt offering. And then what does he do? It says, and it identifies him as the worker of wonders. And to the, he uh, offers it to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And as Manoah and his wife are watching, and the flame goes upward toward heaven, the angel of the Lord goes up in the flame of the altar, not only accepting the sacrifice, but saying, I am identified with this sacrifice. I am this sacrifice to the Lord. So what a wonderful picture there of the work that Christ would do. He would offer himself as a sacrifice, just like that burnt offering for our sin. <clears throat> but that is not even all of the work of Christ that is prefigured here. There, that is very clear. That's unmistakable. But I think there's more than just a hint, not only here of the death of Christ, but of the resurrection of Christ, and particularly of eternal life as it is bestowed upon those for whom Christ died and who believe in him. Verse 23, look at verse 23 with me. But his wife says to him, after Manoah says, we'll surely die, for we have seen God. Well, why would we die from seeing God? Because we're sinners. We deserve to die. The holiness of God will kill us. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. She's telling with the reasoning of a truly great theologian. Manoah's wife is explaining substitutionary atonement to her husband. And she is even explaining the hope of the resurrection. This angel of the Lord has told us about things to come. So instead of dying, as we ought to have done by seeing the angel of the Lord, he's accepted our sacrifice. And because of that sacrifice, we're going to live. And we're going to look forward to these great things of salvation that the Lord is going to do through our son. So, <clears throat> he is saying here, the angel has not only accepted, but identified with that sacrifice as if he himself were being offered up. That sacrifice was made in the stead of Manoah and his wife. And because they are spared from death, they live to experience all the things the angel has promised. Therein is foreshadowed the resurrection. Perhaps just a hint, but very clearly there. So we are able to see how it was that the Lord Jesus was able to explain from the scriptures how it was that he would come, he would suffer, and he would rise again. For the Lord had made provision all through the history of God's people to foreshadow this story over and over again. So we are taught how to read the scriptures because we know that what Jesus has said is true. 
for they speak of him. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you might teach us more and more to see our Lord Jesus, for that is life to us. We fix our eyes on him. We fix our eyes on things above because there is our life. And we know that if we are to offer any service to you, it must be with the life that you have given us. And so, Lord, we pray, feed, sustain our lives with knowing Christ better, seeing him more clearly as he reveals himself in the scriptures. And then we will have that resurrection life, that grace by which we are able to obey, we are able to turn away from sin, we're able to offer you service in the kingdom of God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.